Good afternoon and welcome to the third of the 2021 Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo Lecture Series. My name is Corazon Alvina. On behalf of MUSCAT, permit me to express the hope that you are all well, safe and sound during these trying times. It is an honor and delight to welcome again to MUSCAT's podium, Dr. Patrick Flores, who has agreed to share his thoughts on writing about blended weapons. A couple of years back, he indulged Muscat's request for an art historical essay of the ornament that is also an ornament. It is a major essay in Muscat's publication, A Warrior's Armament and Ornament. He will walk us through the crafting of the chapter. A few minutes before his lecture, I shall introduce uh, Dr. Flores Patrick more appropriately and comprehensively. In the meanwhile, with your indulgence, may I introduce MUSCAT, the Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo, a foundation involved in museum development, studying and safeguarding material culture and cultural education, with Unilab as its main benefactor. The Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo is a diligent student of Philippine culture, as it is a committed champion of Philippine inherited and transmitted kaalaman. Muscat's mission and vision are about knowledge, ancestral and contemporary, coursing through time and across ethno-linguistic groups. Muscat is a generous sharer. It endeavors to provide opportunities through which the public can discover, recuperate, understand, appreciate, and celebrate the complex layers of Filipino kaalaman. In its public programs and projects, resonate to and are animated by the extraordinary features of Philippine tangible and intangible heritage. These activities are animated conversations and celebratory occasions, interactive, infused and enlivened with the remarkable elements of Philippine cultures. Muscat is a keen custodian of tangible culture, inattentive to and mindful of careful research and ethical curatorship. It conceptualizes and actualizes public programs, publications, where for both, Muscat engages and collaborates with acknowledged subject matter experts. Muscat has operationalized collections management guidelines, principally at this time, conservation and registration. It searches for the inspiration behind processes that bring forth the most exquisite textile, the handsomest weapon, astonishing basketry. Muscat is sensitive to the physicality and materiality of the objects themselves to steer not only the study of forms and technology, but also the appropriate conservation strategy for the well-being of cultural objects. It respects the bonds between humans and their environment and the balance that must be maintained between them. Muscat is animated by an understanding that Kaalaman is inherited and transmitted. It recognizes and rejoices in the aesthetic integrity and creative philosophy, in the outstanding skills and the commitment of our artists spiritual sense and essence in Kaalaman. Muscat's resolve is to encourage, to inspire, to invigorate pride, admiration, and affection for Kaalamang Katutubo, as indeed for and in all things Philippines. As promised, a sketch of Dr. Patrick Flores. He is Professor of Art Studies at the Department of Art Studies at the University of the Philippines, which he chaired from 1997 to 2003. He is the curator of the Vargas Museum in Manila. Patrick is the director of the Philippine Contemporary Art Network. He was one of the curators of Under Construction, New Dimensions of Asian Art in 2001-2003 and the Guangzhou Biennale in 2008. He was a visiting fellow at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. in 1999, and he was a guest scholar at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles in 2014. Among his publications are Painting History, 
revisions in Philippine colonial art, remarkable collection, art, history, and the National Museum, and past peripheral curation in Southeast Asia. When I was director of the National Museum, Patrick was seconded to the National Museum's Arts Division as head to lead the review and reorganization of the collection and to curate and install the opening exhibitions of the National Art Gallery. Patrick was the artistic director of the 2019 Singapore Biennale and is the curator of the Taiwan Pavilion for the 2022 Venice Biennale. May I give the floor or the microphone to Dr. Patrick Flores. Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Cora, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, thank you also to Muscat for this uh, invitation. I am honored and it is my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, so the title of my talk is Writing the Bladed Object, Reflections on Descriptions in Museums. Uh, when Cora asked me to contribute to the anthology on Edwin Bautista's collection of bladed objects, I said yes with interest and also with uh, tentativeness. Uh, with tentativeness because I am, not, I am not used to formally annotating objects independent of an art historical program, but also with interest because I wanted to explore the language of description of a bladed object if it were to be articulated as an instance of art. It's uh, stylistic aspects laid bare on the one hand and to disrupt or delay its ethnography via a provisional aesthetic autonomy on the other. To engage in this has conceptual implications, problems in procedure, and in the modes of knowing or the basis of knowability. Does the operation become an anthropology of art or is it an aesthetics of anthropological objects? We are all aware, of course, and this is almost fundamental in the humanities, that a thing or an object is constituted and re-embodied in various ways in practice. It cannot therefore be reduced to or over determined by one method of making and receiving as the object or thing is exceptionally enmeshed in uh, complex materiality and sociality. We can ask for example, uh, need the object be taken under the consideration of art uh, for it to be encountered aesthetically. Uh, this talk would like to reflect on the complications of this gesture layered with the habits of uh, museological work as the object is collected by a collector and turned over to a museum for curatorship. To a certain degree, this museological situation acutely informs the descriptive options for the object as the museum prepares and primes it for preservation, circulation, and pedagogy. It is in this slide that I formulated the abstract of this talk. The task of describing an object within the museum system and public reception has always been a tricky affair. How does one do it without objectifying it? How does one ferret out a context supposedly outside of the said object without denying its capacity to stir up its own sensorium within an intimate and collective experience? What rhetoric or tenor is needed to elude the capture of language and at the same time enhance the potential of language to evoke the object's complexity and ramification? This talk reflects on the tensions to be felt in the attempt to describe and create the atmosphere of presence and knowing and not necessarily just of representation and knowledge. Let me now go through some phases or contexts of this description. First is the name of the object and its kind. And so it's taxonomy and typology that make up the order of things, uh, the distinction as well as the differentiation in the field of language and through philology. Second is the characterization of its presence in the world, whether in terms of function or usefulness or non-function or unusefulness binarisms that support the lamentable discrepancy between art and craft, ornament and self-consciousness, and so on. Third are the signifying properties of the object, 
its meaning-making prospects as language that expresses a culture or represents a tradition, therefore assuming significance or figuration. Fourth is the assessment of the quality of the object according to implicit or explicit criteria that intersects, though is not exclusively conflated with culture and society. A fourth, fifth is the mode of its making and the life world of its maker through resources or forces of human agents, economic imperatives, labor and capital, relations of power. Uh, sixth is the social life of the thing, to reference Arjun Apadurai, or the life of forms by uh, Hungry Poseyon, how the object gets entangled in the thickets or mangroves of everyday life and emergencies, political processes, and even long durations of uneventfulness. Finally, the status or the value of the object and the ways by which it acquires it through ritual or the market, academic validation, or the consecration of the state, and how it is appropriated, sometimes instrumentalized in exchanges informing, for instance, repatriation and social movements. For instance, is the object made from an endangered is, is the object made from an endangered species or has it been looted? It is apparent from the preceding remarks that we need to constellate the object or let it play out in an ecology and not over-invest in its isolation or autonomy, uh, but rather in imbrication or co-implication. While we closely read the object, we also dilate its valence or its nucleus to elaborate on its integrity and position in a context that animates it and which animates more contexts in the fluid instances of engagement. The object therefore does not harden into an identity or an objet d'art or fetish or formalist specimen of a connoisseur or a collector or a medium of mastery that tempts sometimes strained efforts to offer equivalent virtuosity in writing. In hindsight, in revisiting the text for the book, of the bladed object, I realized I dwelled on the ornament, perhaps inspired by the ability of the ornament to attract or to take the breath away and also to defer meaning or objecthood. So to quote, and I'd like to now cite some uh, passages in, 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 in my contribution. So the details of ornament tend to recede into the object as the intricacy of their traces tends to ramify unevenly across the surface of the blade and its parts. In other words, they do not aesthetically incline outward as if they were discrete or were alternatively mere appurtenance. On the one hand, aspects of design are incised and so are absorbed as it were into the instrument or they tightly coil around certain areas and reveal oftentimes stunning densities of quality via bands or ferrules of metal. On the other, the adornment is straightforwardly all over, spread out thinly but sensitively across the ground of the artifact. The tension therefore between instrument and ornament is apparent at the first encounter of this bladed thing the attractiveness of the effect that offers a level of marvel and the thoroughness of the gesture that enhances the efficacy of the device. After all, the very distinguished blade is meant to for something uh, quite blatant. The first matrix is decisively animate. Uh, the pommel is virtually the head of the instrument, and so it tends to serve as an analog of the human or animal head that is by turns apotropic, ethnographic, exotic, primitive, and modern. Since the impulse of the mimicry is animist, it can be argued that the pommel is the nexus between the hand and the handle, the human and the implement. That when held, that when held the, pommel, the pommel must press firmly onto the lunate, the crescent-shaped carpal bone that pivots with the radius, confirms this relationship between the extremity of the human hand and the extremity of the bladed instrument. 
In this kind of grip or grasp involving the two, the agency of the animate radiates across the hand that holds and the blade that is held. Both take on physical power as well as the potency of image, myth, and ecology. In this respect, the Chris may be emblematic, as Herbert Krieger notes, and I quote Krieger, the Chris is held in the hand with guard up. Does the nut chest may serve to catch the edge of the enemy's blade, while the irregularities and ornamentations of the contra guard represent, according to some writers, the conventionalized jaws and fangs of a serpent. Edward Knight says that the perforations in the contra guard represent a record of the number of enemies slain. Here, the Filipino word taga comes to mind, uh, roughly translated as to hack, but in the idiom taga sa panahon, it is to cut in time. In taga sa bato, it is, set, it, it is to set in stone. In many ways, the word pertains to timeliness in all its nuanced declensions, in contrast to, to this decisiveness that only the handle can realize. Absent the handle, the hand is forced to latch onto the blade. This indicates either desperation or heedlessness, thus the phrase kapit sa patalim, or clutching at the edge. The handle of the bladed instrument enables users to carry out tasks as a response to the contested civilizing mission and the violence that attends it, whether to clear paths in forests or prepare food or wage a battle, the blade extends from the body that is complicit in the project of archipelagic ethnogenesis or end of colonial modernity. As such, it may be viewed in relation to cognate objects that affirm power and the hierarchies it generates to ordain a certain order of things. The cane or the walking stick comes to mind as a kindred material. It is an object of many guises, support, defense, vanity. It too can be ornamented to suit the taste of the user or to demonstrate his or her stature in the milieu. In this light, the bladed instrument, if made to stand on its edge and if regarded as a cipher of sovereignty or aspirations to it, can only be a totem, emblematic of ancestry or clan, exemplary of ties with the world around it, nature, human being, symbol, privilege, end of quote. In this reflection, I am guided by the ideas of the anthropologist Tim Ingold and broadly speaking, Alfred Gell, who insists on the agency of art as well as its patiency of making things happen and of being acted upon. According to Ingold, and I quote him, making is a practice of weaving in which practitioners bind their own pathways or lines of becoming into the texture of material flows comprising the life world. Rather than reading creativity backwards from a finished object to an initial intention in the mind of an agent, this entails reading it forwards in an ongoing generative movement that is, one, that is at once itinerant, improvisatory, and rhythmic. To illustrate what this means in practice, I compare carpentry and drawing. In both cases, making, making is, a mat, is a matter of finding the grain of the world's becoming and following its course. Historically, it was the turn from drawing lines to pulling them straight between predetermined points, which mark the transition from the textilic to the architectonic. Debasing the former as craft, meaning <clears throat> textile, while elevating the latter as technology, meaning carpentry or architecture. I am also struck by Susan Stewart, who proposes a generous and vulnerable approach to sensing the object as akin to sensing the encounter with the other. I am interested in this other as formative and of the sensual or sensuous subjectivity, a relationship that cannot be conveniently harmonized or synchronized. And so Stuart argues, and I quote her, the non-simultaneous and non-present are my primary rapport, rapport with the other in time. This means that the other is forever beyond me, irreducible to the synchrony of the same. The temporality of the interhuman opens up the meaning of otherness and the otherness of meaning, end of quote. So 
when we invest agency in the object, we render it subjectively and we instill in it a subjectivity. Our ties with it, meaning the object, therefore become intersubjective and inevitably complicate the coherence of meaning and the conceit of, of uh, human subjectivity. Because the object as subject always slips away from our instinct or acumen, an elusiveness that makes us doubt the certainty or constancy, constancy of meaning and exposes us or gets us excited about otherness. So it's no longer the object-subject dichotomy in which we alone are the subjects. No? The object itself has been endowed with subjectivity. So our relationship with it becomes intersubjective. Finally, I turn to the Philippine language that helps us overcome the false choices of form and content of art and society, for instance. It is instructive that the word likha of refers to the image of the dead ancestor that is buried with the body. It is also the derogatory idol or larawan, so fused with mass and rondure or bulto of colonial anathema, codified in both the dictionaries of Pedro de San Benaventura in 1613 and Francisco de San Antonio in 1624. How likha would transfigure into likha, likha. Uh, which is a creation, an object, an invention, a contrivance, a thing, foreshadows the conceptualization of art and of aesthetics in Pedran, Pedro Serrano Lactaus 1914 dictionary, in which Likha inhabits the lexical continuum with sinning, which expresses thoughtfulness and deliberation, as well as conjecture, bulay, dili dili, kuro, limi, nilay, wari, and so on. Likha and sinning subtend creation and reflection as in like likhang sinning no? from the prior spirit and relic of likha. This transfiguration is important because it is simultaneously orthographic and conceptual with the change in, mean, in naming informing the change in conceiving what needs to be named anew. Laktao who was involved in the revolutionary movement against Spain programmed the swerve from ancient Philippine script to Romanized Spanish, and finally to modern Tagalog. Away from the Likha, Likha dynamic in Lactaus 1889 volume, the entry for inventive facture is Arte, which covers basically instructions for doing anything well in both military and artistic domains. The comprehensive genus is a collective, in fact, a katipunan, which was the appellation as well of the anti-colonial revolution. Arte is the, the quote, katipunan ng mga aral at regla ng magaling na paggawa, or the collection of lessons and directions in fine labor or making. In the area of security, it is about offense and offense and defense or struggle. In the noblest and bellious artists under the liberal ages, it is about profound and transcendent rumination. Yaong ang lalong gamit ay pag-iisip at talino. In adjacency, in adjacency to Arte in Lactaus Dictionary, are Adornar and Artisano, words around the precept of ornament, invested in the acuity of the hand and the eye, but not the mind. Now, so this, there is this uh, binarism. Uh, embedded in the lexicon or the lexicography. Alongside Likha, and this is still an uh, ongoing research on my part, alongside Likha are the Visayan words buta, butang, which refers to both thing and condition, like pagkabutang or kabutangan, and bati, which is hearing, but also feeling. So I'm interested in words that uh, overcome uh, binary sense, no? like likha, uh, butang, and also bati. No? So I think this will you know, help us uh, uh, create a knowledge system that is hospitable to the, to the fluidity of, of experience and also of the making of the object. And so I end with the idea of reflection as an act of language and the register through which I, it must resonate. 
in a recent discussion on museums, I was taken by curator Trevor Smith's idea of experience as a product is as a, as a productive, as a productive and not only a spectatorial moment. I am reminded of the French language in which to experience is also to experiment. When I consulted the old Tagalog Spanish dictionary, pagdanas is likewise to experience and to experiment. Smith looks into the tension between the erotic and the epistemic the inflections of the encounter of the object in the museum. And so it is in writing. And so it is in writing objects through descriptions in museums, which after all are vessels of curiosities and fantasies. So these pieces of writing must shed light, which in Tagalog is magpaliwanag. So, and so must evoke by supplem supplementing the otherness of meaning or the otherness of language or the uh, language and meaning of the other. In the uh, constellative or constellational curation of the description through myriad perspectives of discourse and disciplines and the vibrant impulses of sound, image, intertext, movement, utterance, and other potent presences from within and all over. So thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Patrick, as usual. Uh, Thought-provoking and uh, opens many doors to many discussions that can be had about uh, describing uh, museologically, because as anthropologists, um, well, we're not shackled, but I think in anthropology, it's uh, more precise, you know, we're given to position, and so there is no way um, uh, to to uh, to editorialize, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because a basket is a basket, we must not even say that it is a basket for fruits, because we don't know if that was really the function for it, and so it's very straightforward. And uh, you describe a color, you describe the texture, and um, you you uh, if you're not uh, if you did not have primary uh, research, you can't even say as I said that it was for fruits. It was made by this person, and it came from that community because, for all you know, it could have been traded uh, mm -hmm. from another community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, and yet there is a very um, strong stimulus. Because material culture opens itself up, mm. well, not to romanticization, but uh, to descriptive, a fine description of the objects. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of that? I mean, how, how to balance mm -hmm. uh, a gracious text but with the, that is uh, both precise mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, as we say, not embellished. You know, that's always a thing that we tell the, uh, the, the anthropologists starting. No romanticization, no embellishment, just tell it what, as it is. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good point, Cora. And it's always, it's an everyday dilemma of uh, curators and anyone who is engaged in the description of objects and also presenting the objects in, 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 in a situation like the, the museum. So uh, what you mentioned about precision and uh, uh, let us say uh, uh, fidelity or faithfulness mm -hmm. to, its, uh, to the use of the, let us say from the source community now, mm -hmm. uh, I think that is only one moment in the, in the descriptive enterprise. Huh? Okay. And that we have to consider other moments and therefore should speak in other registers. Mm -hmm. uh, so the empirical work is one type of work that is important in the description of the object, not through, and then that you know, research will help you in, in that regard, uh, scholarship, uh, uh, field work, and so on and so forth. But uh, these objects are not static, no? they also move around and they, uh, they change hands yes. and then, and so on and so forth. So the circulation of the object transformations over time in history uh, is also part, should also be part of the description. 
No? Yes, because uh, well, it is because you trace the provenance. You know, that's yeah. one of the uh, important things, especially in uh, well, in all you know, in all that that uh, deal in all the fields that deal with uh, all the disciplines that deal with objects. The provenance, of course, is very important. And yeah. as you said, that that is the movement. And uh, those are little moments in time when they change hands, when they change communities, where they're sold, whether they are captured. Uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, expatriated, repatriated, all of those are moments. But I'm, I was talking about the object itself, the description of the object, the hard, uh, you know, it yeah. is steel, it is straight back, it is pointed, it is bifurcated, right. you know, those yeah. things. Yeah, but I think the circulation of the object, the object, uh, the form of the object uh, uh, also absorbs the circulation. So, I mean, if, you know, if it gets blunted at, at, at some point, or mm -hmm. if, if it, you know, through use, for instance, or if it is uh, ornamented or layered with another thing, uh, used with maybe a modern-day object. So, I mean, uh, the, 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 the absorption, I mean, the, 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 the object also absorbs the circulation. And so, when you describe uh, the form, you also describe the... Uh, the uh, uh, circulations almost yeah, sorry. simultaneously. Yeah, but so in effect, you do you you do that, no? Because when it changes hands, the uh, the change, you no, know, the transfer mm -hmm. uh, is uh, Mary's description as well. As well, yeah. And the changes that occur during that transfer. Correct. And so the empirical work that should not be the only type of work. No, involved in the description because there is also the speculative work, mm -hmm. like uh, how it might have, you know, yeah. changed or circulated. So, uh, so that's also another moment in the description, you know? um, another register of writing. Because when you when you uh, deal with the different aspects of the object, you also have to find the 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 most productive uh, tenor or uh, register of language uh, in which it should be, I mean, that, you know, that uh, aspect should be written. No? But what so, informs the speculative, uh, um, speculative aspect of it? What mm -hmm. uh, events, what uh, uh, characteristics of the object, uh, the the landscape or the context what uh, what will feed the speculative uh, aspect of it well i mean a combination of all of those and at a, a certain point one takes risks now mm -hmm. i mean every i mean not i mean phenomenon cannot be reduced to empiricism no? so uh, it's how you also how the writer takes to the object in terms of phenomenology, I mean the the visceral uh, the visceral uh, response, mm -hmm. the object independent of the object. No, I mean that of course uh, 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 facilitated through the through the encounter. So that is one uh, instance of speculation. Uh, one entry point into speculation. Another entry point might be. Um, Contemporary usage, mm -hmm. no? contemporary usage, or uh, the embeddedness of the name of the object in idiomatic expression. Yeah. No? So I mean, you know, you don't. You, I mean, you now refer to other disciplines, no? and then you 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 can uh, create uh, a speculation out of this. No? So why it, why did it become part of an idiom? No? Mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. So, so that's one moment. That's another moment, the speculative moment, of course, the empirical moment, and also the literary moment because you write it. Mm -hmm. so there is a textual moment to it. Yeah. It is a, it's a form of writing. Uh, so there's nothing natural about it. There's nothing uh, infallible about it. Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, it is a proposition, textual proposition. So one must be attentive to the kind of writing that is happening no? mm -hmm. uh, in relation to all the other concerns that we have, we have mentioned. Now, there is the literary aspect, no? the, the, the writing that 
maybe inspires or the writing that uh, engages na? Uh, and the writing that is open too and I think we should advocate this that should invite uh, people to uh, themselves imagine and speculate <laughs> not only consume the writing or or, or uh, take it as gospel truth no? yeah, yeah. Okay. stimulative to thinking that's hopefully. Right. Yeah. Yeah. hopefully that's the kind of writing yeah. that, that you know as well as all these moments no? yeah. Uh, yeah. so uh, I mean uh, to pick up on writing no? or register of writing uh, Cora you, you as, a, as a curator in in uh, museums and also as a writer, uh, uh, what might have been the lessons uh, in terms of practice of trying to, for instance, uh, write about an object and then uh, uh, migrate that kind of writing in the context of a museum, like what you did in, in the Met or at the National Museum, or migrate that writing to a newspaper, like mm-hmm. what you did for Manila Times with Philly Santa Maria for yeah, the yeah. for the Halupi column. Yes, so, yes. So, I mean, there are different registers of writing involved. All you, although you, you you deal with objects, huh? Yes, yes. yes. So what are your reflections? Do you have reflections on this? Well, Halupi, we because uh, Philly and I decided that uh, we would be guided by uh, you know we go with the calendar. Okay, so, um, so that that was also part of the discipline that we would have to write every day. Mm-hmm. But we sat down to choose what we would write for each day, whether uh, we looked at calendar of events and then the objects that could be related to the events, to the uh, uh, to to concepts that mm-hmm. would have been stimulated by uh, persons, uh, events, activities. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, we also dealt with uh, nature. If you if you remember, uh, mm-hmm. we dealt with organic stuff, mm-hmm. and also with folklore. So it was a I I don't know how we we did it, but it was so, some sort of uh, maybe uh, what would you call uh, visceral? It was just reacting to uh, mm-hmm. what was out there uh, when we were doing the research. So it was more an at large. Um, at large writing, but then we curated it according to days. You know, it was the days that uh, really um, ordained what we would write for the day. Mm. So, but it was uh, an object-based uh, column, no? So you well, uh, most, but we, sometimes we would uh, we would stray. Sometimes we would pick up on a um, an issue. You know, maybe it was uh, tobacco day, you know, smoking, or it was uh, get a building for the National Museum at that time. I, th- I remember Picanam was uh, still trying to get the Senate as uh, the venue for the National Museum. So we would support certain issues as well. So in that way, perhaps you can say it was advocacy, advocative and uh, journalistic as well, because uh, we would go with uh, the quote-unquote current events or current affairs as well, because uh, we also wanted some sort of, well, not some sort of, but we wanted it to be relevant so that uh, it would be read. Yeah, and uh, obviously the approach was interdisciplinary, no? Yes. Uh, like so, but what was your main entry point into into an object? Was there like uh, a uh, default entry point that Phyllis and you uh, uh, decided to? I mean, Felice always went with uh, inherent value in terms mm-hmm. of, you know, value system. I went with the material or the function. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think these are interesting reflections, no? I yeah. mean, there are many entry points into the object. It can yeah. be value or mm-hmm. usability or yeah. maybe benefaction. No? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, to say, uh, let me just clarify, it was value, mm-hmm. not monetary value, but value intrinsically to one's culture, to one's person, to one's beliefs. Mm-hmm. And then you, you, you went with material. Was there a, an effort to mix the two? I mean, in the, in the course of the writing. Yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, but, but uh, how, how did we do it? Sometimes when we felt that something was important enough that you could mix, we wrote separately and we, we blended it into one column. So you will see 
mm-hmm. uh, at some instances the columns are co-authored you know the two uh, of yeah. us two of us appear as authors as opposed to you know usually it was every day single author but there would be points there would be issues there that the both of us wrote about the same thing and uh, it was uh, interlarded but in terms of your museum work Cora was mm-hmm. was the writing different, the writing of the object. Yes, yes, because as I said, as an anthropologist, I became uh, mm-hmm. more strict uh, with uh, well information, words, and but I also followed you. I remember because when you were doing the mm-hmm. uh, National Art Gallery, mm-hmm. you did not want to exhibit anything that did not have enough information, mm-hmm. and. Uh, And that was also the way I was moving with uh, anthropology and archaeology. You don't put out everything unless there is, uh, you know, data, there's information that will not be uh, a, a misinformation, will not be misused, will not be uh, uh, mis, uh, misinterpreted. And so I became stricter and stricter, actually. Uh, with the Met, um, Because I started the a, a mixed program, no, it was a multidisciplinary a multidisciplinary uh, program. I moved away from strictly art, mm-hmm. but also because it was an uh, educative. I mean, the motor of the Met was really education. So we had to write in terms of a in terms of pedagogy that uh, Feliz Mariles Ebro they had set that up, and so we had to write that certain way. But in the National Museum, being in general. Um, Museum. I thought that it could those um, the disciplines could be um, more productively mm-hmm. in be informative for one another in terms of both curatorial work and the subsequent writing and the educational programs. Yeah, I think that the idea of the interdiscipline is important. No? Yeah, because uh, we work. I mean, we work within interdisciplinary collections. No? Uh, yes. The National yeah. Museum is uh, in, intrinsically interdisciplinary. Yeah. Uh, I work at the Vargas Museum, which has uh, different sorts of materials aside from art. And at the Met, you also had this program. Of, yes. Uh, interdisciplinary and- program beyond, beyond Arturo Luce's conception of international modern art, yeah. right? Yeah. And because I, I think it was at that time that we thought about engaging, not only, you know, being a, a passive uh, tenant of the Banco Central, but we mm-hmm. proposed that we use their collections as well. And so if you notice, we were curating from the visual arts collection, but then we also went into their uh, ecclesiastical collection. And so we had Santos and eventually into uh, the ecclesiastical, uh, I mean, the uh, colonial jewelry. And finally, of course, the gold mm-hmm. and the co- co-eval um, archaeological finds, you know, which would be the pottery. Yeah. And uh, the, the, my final point in my, in my talk, had something to do with the curatorial, no? because the, the writing uh, is intertwined with the curatorial. Yes. Uh, in fact, writing, I mean, in you write, you curate, no? Yes, yes. And, and when you curate, you, of course, you, you, you ex- try to explain and try to articulate the, the curatorial sensibility in, in terms of writing. Uh, so the two are quite intertwined no mm-hmm. and uh, this is what we did when we reorganized the uh, the visual art collection of the national museum yes. and i was seconded uh, to the institution during your your term so mm-hmm. I, i i proposed to you that we uh, look at the the national uh, the, the collection the visual art collection and, and then the 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 National Art Gallery, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in the context of the other materials uh, in the museum. Yeah, and I remember you, you, uh, you also approached it uh, uh, in in view of or in the light of the fact that the National Museum was established as a museum of ethnology, and so you began uh, from there. No, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah, and also, so we we wanted to also restore the ecology. Yes. In the interrelationship of objects within a museum system. Yes. Uh, because that uh, colonial administration put in place uh, compartments, no? like archaeology and anthropology, uh, 
botany, bio, uh, and zoo, art, art history, history, and then yeah. and then art. So we wanted to, I mean, in a modest way, to to at least uh, create uh, uh, a, a different matrix in which uh, or a possibility, even mm -hmm. just a conceptual possibility, and also a curatorial a curatorial opportunity for for this to to come together through the entry point of of art no mm -hmm. so of visual art so this is why this is how the the five exhibitions yes. uh, were uh, conceptualized no? the influx intimation incar incarnation uh, inculcation and then um, inclination no? yes. so uh, th th these were discursive uh, discursively framed uh, but uh, the framing uh, emerged from the material, the material yes. themselves. Uh, so this is what I mean when, when I say that the material, the materiality, also informs the writing. Mm -hmm. So it's not just you are writing about the object, but you write with the object. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you write with the object. It's not just on the object, about the object but with the object or around the object or through the object through the object so we, we i think we should change our our prepositions now when we, <laughs> when, we when we uh describe our relationship with yes. objects in terms of of writing yeah. yes yeah but and, um mm. I would like to ask, you know, you also curated, I mean, for me, uh, for the, I think, was I chairman of Asimus, uh, Bisa, no, which was uh, self-portraits with uh, Kenji, Yoshida, and uh, Brian Durance. And mm -hmm. since we, were, we are talking about writing, was there ever a catalog written uh, <laughs> for the music, for the met part of it? There was a dream to do it, <laughs> or a desire to do it. And yeah. Uh, images have been uh, they were photographed, collected. Remember, yeah. have been collected, yes. but yeah, it's a pity that we were not able to document that uh, exhibition. It was uh, a response to the uh, self and other mm -hmm. project of the uh, Asimos now. Yes, yes, uh, uh, that opened uh, in uh, in Osaka. The Museum of Technology. So it was about self and other. So mm -hmm. I re-articulated re it as BISA, mm -hmm. or potent presences and uh, uh, thought of uh, sections that uh, spoke to time, mm -hmm. time, because I wanted the, the relationship between self and other to be grounded in, in, in history. So again, that was an interdisciplinary exhibition, uh, mm -hmm. while predominantly consisting of art, uh, it uh, reached out to other types of objects, mm -hmm. no? like uh, a document, for instance, of a survey of school children about national identity, yeah. or the shoes of Nora Honor, yes. uh, or... Uh, the bulul mm -hmm. no? or the painting of a, of a uh, revolutionary and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And of course, contemporary art in relation yes. to, to colonial and modern art. So it was a, a, a mixing of, uh, of objects to, to flesh out the notion of, of visa as, mm -hmm. as, as potency. No? So that kind of mixture demands a, a different level of writing or description. Okay. description. So in the face of this mixture, you cannot just uh, revert to a default type of writing that mm -hmm. uh, relies exclusively on, let us say, empirical work. So uh, the material itself, the, I mean, uh, independently uh, demands more. And the curation of the material, of the materials, also makes another level of demand. Yeah. You curate uh, internationally, and uh, I don't know. If this is a dumb question. Mm -hmm. Is the do you make a difference? Do you write differently for for various audiences? For instance, you're writing for uh, you you curated the first uh, our 
renewed participation in the Venice Biennale. Did you write differently? Did you have to um, re refocus or uh, your your writing? What is if there is a difference? What is it that is different between writing for uh, our audiences here and writing for an international audience? Well, yeah, it's a it's a good question, but. Yeah, I always when I write, I, I think about the audience. No? Uh, in in the case of the pavilion, it's uh, it's a mix no? of, of 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 publics no? to engage with. So the, it's a national pavilion, mm -hmm. so, uh, so it should also, it should speak to it should speak to national concerns or uh, partly to the idea of representation. No? I'm aware of that politics and. And I don't dismiss it, but on the other hand, this national pavilion plays out in a uh, in a global context. Mm -hmm. So there is another uh, layer, another type of audience mm -hmm. that I uh, that I am in conversation that I am in conversation with. No? so. Uh, uh, I, I am also cognizant of, of that. So to, to answer your question, it's a mix of registers all the time. And there is no formula for this. Uh, it's just constant practice. <laughs> constant writing will, will help you find the, mm -hmm. not really the balance, no, but uh, uh, a certain tone that uh, can address various publics. No? But of course, when I write for the wall text in Vargas Museum, it's different. No? Yeah. So I write for a textbook, mm -hmm. different. When I write for a newspaper, it's, it's, it's different. But, uh, so we always shift no? mm -hmm. uh, registers. And I think that is important for, for, our, our, for our practice. And it was curatorial work that gave me... Uh, I mean, offered more agility mm -hmm. rather than the academic art historical work, which is yeah. you know, more, let us say, uh, set in its ways. No? Shall I say more decajon rather than nimble? <laughs> That's right. so, but curatorial work makes you more nimble. Yes. Uh, because curatorial work exposes you to different demands, no? mm -hmm. different interests from... A large, I mean, you know, a more uh, varied constituency, which is good, no? Because the materials yeah. that you curate also come from a uh, very granular ecology. Yeah. So it's, I think, uh, just uh, right mm -hmm. for to to keep on shifting all the time. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Well, I think we've taken up too much of your time. It is always a pleasure to be in the company of Dr. Patrick Flores. Mm -hmm. Listening to him is quite a privilege and a learning experience. Maraming salamat, Patrick, at sana sa uulitin. Thank you, Cora. Yes, okay lang kung uulitin. <laughs> oh, maraming salamat po. Salamat. Our heartfelt appreciation goes as well to you, our friends, likers, and followers. Thank you for being with us. We hope to see you during our forthcoming online activities, more lectures, online exhibitions, posts, and podcasts. Please go to our FB page for announcements. Do like us. We are also on Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify. Meanwhile, let us continue to celebrate and be proud of Philippine culture. Do continue to stay safe. We will survive and thrive. Till the next lecture. Maraming salamat. At magandang dapit hapon po sa kanilang lahat.